A warm welcome, everyone, to this first negotiation briefing from COP25 and the Nordic Pavilion here in Madrid. A warm welcome also to our audience in uh, Stockholm, which is uh, the Nordic country's back door to these um, climate negotiations, uh, which actually means that um, people in the Nordic countries doesn't really have to fly into Madrid. They could take the train to Stockholm. That is our Nordic solution to this. And welcome also to our viewers on YouTube and uh, Facebook where we are broadcasting live as we speak. With me here on stage in Madrid tonight, I have the head of the Danish delegation to the UNFCCC, Annette Eierstedt. A warm welcome to you, and we are very excited to have you here. Thank you very much. My name is um, André Jamolt, and I will be the moderator for this uh, event. And uh, with us from Stockholm, we also have uh, Marie Strin, who will... Um, keep a keen eye on uh, the audience in uh, Stockholm. Isn't that right, Mary? That is right. I am looking at them right now. There are people coming in all the time. So if you guys in Stockholm uh, have any questions, uh, please raise your hand and uh, Mary will let me know as we go along. For our viewers on the social media, please write your questions in the comment field underneath this uh, broadcast uh, and uh, my uh, colleagues um, back door or uh, behind the scene will let me know and I will forward the questions to Annette here. So enough of uh, all the practicalities. Let's get that get down to business, Annette. Um, there are some 25,000 people expected to visit COP during the next two weeks, but uh, there is only a handful of people who are actually negotiating. You are one of those, and uh, you have what experience is in this area. Uh, so first, could you please tell or explain to us um, what exactly is this UNFCCC? Yeah, I'll try to explain it. Just to say there's more than just a handful of negotiators here. I would say that. <laughs> but just to say, this is the conference of the parties of the UNFCCC, which is the convention of climate change. But what's actually taking place is that we have the conference of parties of the UNFCCC, of the Paris Agreement, of the Kyoto Protocol. So for that, there's a lot of negotiations going around uh, these days. So this is the decision-making place for the parties to the convention. I think my next uh, question is uh, equally easy, I hope. Um, because what really intrigues me is how you're going about the negotiations. How do you play this game? <laughs> yeah, it is a game. Uh, no, the negotiations is divided in a lot of different tracks. Some of them are very, very technical and into very small details where you really need to have been into this for years to understand what's actually going on. So we have a number of rooms here where negotiation is taking place. I think there's 25 of them around here where we have different tracks in the negotiations that are going on. For this first week, it's mostly technical and it's negotiators on my level and on technical level. And then for next week, we have the high level segment where we will have the pol politicians coming in. So we will have the ministerial segment and therefore we will have some more political negotiations taking place there. So what we cannot solve on technical level, we will have to take to the next week and then we'll have to involve our ministers. Yesterday, we heard a lot about what the young people is expecting from this COP. What are your expectations for the 2019 negotiations? Um, I think I have different kind of expectations. For the negotiation, well, I hope we really will get a, long, um, get a lot of work done on the technical issues. But I also have some expectations for everything that's going around outside of the negotiations. As you can see, those of you who are here in Madrid, we have a lot of pavilions, we have a lot of action going on where the different stakeholders are actually talking to each other. How can we do something more to address the climate change? What can we do to accelerate the climate action? And how can we, when the politicians are coming here, 
send a strong message to us to say, well, we need to do more. I think that's also kind of what the youth are asking us to do. We need to do more. We need to do something to stop the climate change and the effects that we see in the environment at this point. So I have some expectations for the negotiations as such, because if we don't have the rules in place, we cannot follow what we are doing. We cannot look into what others are doing. So that needs to be in place. And then we have to do the real action where we have to involve much more stakeholders than just the governments. Yeah, because as you said, action is kind of the buzzword for this COP. Mm. Um, how much action is it around the negotiation table? Are, are you focused on action at all? Yes, we are focusing on action. We are also focusing on rules. And that might be a bit boring if you're not into it, but we need to have the rules in place, as I said just before. But we also, at least from our point, from Danish side, focusing on having rules that will help us enhance our ambitions over time, because that's needed. So for that, we do have action in there, and we have it in our minds, but it's not that much action in the rooms as such, if that's what you're asking. One of um, <clears throat> the special things for, for the Nordic delegations is that you have youth delegates. Yeah. Um, and uh, yesterday, the Norwegian youth delegate, Sofia Norvik, told us um, that she has high expectations for the negotiators as well as the politicians. Mm. And she, kind of behalf of the young people, demanded that you listen to the young people and brought their ideas and solutions to the table. Are you listening to the youth delegates in that matter? Yes, we are listening to the youth delegates. We have two in our delegation. They're not here yet, but they will come. And we're actually meeting with them every morning to hear what have they, what have they heard, what are they looking into. But I also think that the ministers are listening to the youth and to see what's important and what do we need to do more. And they have inspired this to say, well, we in Denmark, but also for the Nordic countries, have quite ambitious governments at this point. And that's also because they have listened to what has been said on the streets, on the strikes and stuff like that. So yes, they are listening. Could you give us an example uh, of an idea or a youth solution, if you like, that have gotten from, that you have gotten from the young people and who has ended up on the negotiation table? Maybe not directly <laughs> to the negotiation table, but at least I know that the youth delegates that we brought yes, uh, last year to Katowice had this idea to have this youth council in Denmark. And that was established because of their meeting with the minister at the last COP in Denmark. Mm. Um, I cannot say specifically that we have brought this to the negotiation table, but we have this intention to do, for, for instance, when we are discussing what we call Article 6 of the Paris Agreement, which is this market mechanisms. For us, it's very important that we listen to others to say, well, this should be something that helps us deliver on, ambi amb deliver on ambition over time. And that's kind of also listening to say, well, that's what they want, so that's what we have to do. Mm -hmm. I think it's time actually to, to let our audience uh, kind of take over my job and ask some questions. Um, Mary, uh, are there any questions from the audience in uh, Stockholm? Are there any questions from the audience in Stockholm? Yes, we have a question. Yeah, Uno Svedin, Stockholm Resilience Center. Um, I'm interested in the perspective of the time. Um, um, over the exponential that needs to be handled. And then we all know that the first part is more important than the others because uh, we need to save uh, sort of strong efforts in the beginning of the curve in order to have the curve starting. So what are the um, thinking about these curves? especially the first part, let's say the first eight years, ten years. Thank you. Go ahead, Aneta. I think the science tells us that we are in a hurry, we need to do something more, and we need to do it fast. And that's at least what we are listening to. So that's something that you point into, that we next year will have to see revised national determined contribution that would say what does, does each and every party 
commit itself to do up until 2030. And that's one of the major issues that should come out of this. We need to put a pressure on the major emitters, but basically to all to say, well, you need to enhance your ambitions. You need to come with more um, ambitious goals next year. And that's one of the things that we will try to convey this message. And I'm sure my ministers will come and say the same next week. May I, may I have a question myself? If that is okay. Go ahead, Mary. Go uh, ahead. Because uh, when I when I hear you say this, you say we. This is what we want. Who 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 is we here? Right now, we is Denmark. It's okay. also the Nordic countries. We, when I talk about we, Denmark is negotiating through the EU. So we will have to first influence the EU to do something more, and then the EU will also go out and say something to say, well, we need the major emitters to do more. I'm, I'm talking from a Danish perspective. I think I'm kind of talking about from a Nordic perspective as well. Now I have to be careful, but we have kind of the same ambitions. So I'm speaking from a Danish perspective when I say we. I think uh, it, it might be uh, okay for our international audience here in Madrid to, to emphasize the fact that even though the Nordic countries are seen as one, there are five different countries mm -hmm. and there are negotiating separately but then again back to you how much do you talk to your partners from the other nordic countries how much do you cooperate in the negotiations uh, of course well sweden finland and denmark are part of the european Commun uh, Euro european union sorry <laughs> uh, so we see each other every day and we speak together as for Norway and Iceland, we also communicate with them. We have a Nordic meeting going on just now in the Danish pavilion, actually, to say what do we want to do more? How can we use each other? Where have we similarities? And where can we find common grounds and stuff like that? We will also have our Nordic ministers to meet next week. They have an informal meeting as well. So for that, we do coordinate. And we, when we see each other around the halls, we also we know each other. So for that reason, we are actually also coordinating. I think it's time to, to see if there are any questions here in Madrid to the head of the, the Danish delegation. Are there any questions? Don't be shy. No? But we have Mary. one more. Yes, I do yes. have a question here. Thank you. I'm, I'm Jonas. I'm from Denmark. And I want to ask you specifically, how can you negotiate uh, on behalf of Denmark when our current government is still financing or still negotiating their climate ambitions for the next four years? We haven't heard anything about the climate law except promises through the campaign in the spring. So you say you, you, you negotiate for Denmark. And I ask you, on what foundation do you negotiate for Denmark? I negotiate on a political mandate on different issues. I know that there's negotiations going on in Denmark right now to establish the climate law, but we do have set this national target of 70% reduction in 2030. We have a government that said we have to do more, we need to be ambitious. So for that reason and for that background, I can negotiate from that political mandate. Yes, any more questions from uh... Stockholm, from, Mary. From me, one more question, if that's okay. <laughs> uh, I'd like to know when you when you say uh, that uh, you are ambitious, and you also say that the the other Nordic countries are ambitious. Uh, would you say that if you compare the Nordics to the rest of the world, where do you find those that are aiming for approximately at least the same things that you do? Oh, that's a bit difficult to say. Well, we do have other EU countries who are ambitious as well. We do have some of the Latin American countries who have set net zero targets as well in 2050. Um, I think we have a lot of the developing countries and the small island states, which are very ambitious on this as well. They don't have the same kind of emissions that we have, so they don't have the same kind of reduction targets. But still, we need to make sure that in order for them to develop, we need to make sure that they do it in the right way. And I think there's a lot of attention to that in the developing countries as well. I think we have a question from the audience here. Yes. Please uh, wait for the mic and, and then uh, 
present yourself. Yes, hello. Um, my name is Asker, and I'm a student at Tufts University. Um, I am wondering, now that the U.S. is taking less of an active stance here in the climate negotiations internationally, how do you manage to persuade and put pressure on China and India to cut their emissions now that the leverage from the U.S. is weakened, sort of? It is a challenge, to be honest, yes, because now we don't have the U.S. taking the lead. But we do have the EU as a major player, uh, and we're really trying to influence the EU position so that we have EU as a global leader and then for EU to cooperate, especially with China, because they're quite an important player on this one. If we don't have China, well, it's going to be difficult. From a Danish perspective, we also have bilateral uh, cooperation with both China and India on renewable energy and stuff like that to actually try to have some of our experience out in their countries as well, help them with the green transition. But EU should be, we're trying to have EU to take the place of the EU, US, if you can say it like that, as a global leader together with the others. Thank you. Any more, there's a question behind there, back there. Um, hello, I'm Al Birk. I'm the Icelandic Youth Delegate. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, yesterday uh, at the opening ceremony of COP, uh, it was said that right now we need to reduce global emissions by 7.6% every year until 2030 to be able to uh, stay below the 1.5 degree target. Do you believe that Denmark will reduce their carbon emissions by 7.6% next year or the year after that? Is that something that you, you see happening with the current um, actions? Well, as was said just before, we're negotiating a new climate law in Denmark, basically these days. We have set a national target of 70% reduction of greenhouse gases in 2030. So that put us in the curve to do it. Whether or not it will be within the first year, I don't know because that will depend on one thing, the climate law, but also the climate action plan, which comes afterwards to say, now we have the law, now we have the goal, how are we going to implement it? And that's for negotiations soon, but at least we have the long-term goal and we are committed to fulfill this goal, even though it's going to be difficult. Uh, we have one more question back here in Madrid. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little, uh, I'm a bit of insider because I work here in the Nord Nordic Pavilion as uh, Andreas' colleague, but I was wondering when you say um, uh, you say about the Nordic countries, and we know that the Nordic countries and, and uh, Denmark are very ambitious when it comes to fighting the climate change and in the nego negotiations. But there are also, of course, uh, countries that are not so ambitious. Otherwise, we wouldn't have any negotiations because everybody would be on the same side. But what what's uh, what are the grounds? for the hesitation among those uh, those countries who are a little bit uh, not so ambitious how do, how do they describe the hesitation and what are they what are they the reasons to that they're not as ambitious as as, as we are well it's a bit difficult for me to say why they are hesitating uh, to do that i think this is a long road that you have to take and you have to commit to do this even though you don't have all the solutions in place. I think some are waiting to see do we actually have the solutions on this one? Can wind, water, uh, solar power actually do it? Uh, can we actually, um, what's it called? do we need the fossil fuel still? We do for some time probably, but how can we get to take it out? and still secure that we will have a sound uh, development and an economic uh, growth. I think there's some doubts around that one. How can we do it best? There could also be some financial issues into this, that this is costly. It's cost of Denmark, it costs in the Nordic countries a lot of money to be where we are today. How can we actually facilitate to do this in other countries as well? So there could be more reasons for that, and there could also be some national circumstances that say, well, we are an oil producing country, so we actually want to keep it like that. Thank you. And um, we are close to the end of uh, this short briefing, uh, but before we say goodbye, Annette, I would like to ask you if you are optimistic about the outcome of these negotiations. I have to be. I am, at this point I am. 
I do know that we're going to have some very difficult discussions, especially two subjects that we know are going to hit the ministers next week, and it's going to be difficult. But we have to try and we have to believe that we can succeed in this one. Uh, and we also have to believe that we can send the message that we need more action now. I have so much wanted to ask you about what those two issues are, but uh, we are running out of time and we do uh, come back with uh, briefings from the negotiations tomorrow as well at the same time. So I think it's, uh, and it's going on for two weeks, so we will get time to get back to those issues. Thank you for being with us. You're welcome. Thank you, Stockholm, for uh, listening in. And thank you to all our viewers on YouTube and Facebook. See you in uh, about 10 minutes uh, when we will be back for a new event. Thank you.
Dear friends, welcome to Norshian House and to this uh, evening uh, discussion that we will have, have here during our Nordic Climate Action Weeks. And welcome also to you that follow us from Madrid or from wherever in the world you might be. Uh, I will now give the floor to the moderator of this evening's talk, Kristina Persson, founder of Global Utmaning and former Minister of Strategic Development and also of Nordic Cooperation. Yes. <laughs> the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much, Maria. And I'm very happy to be here and to be moderator. Uh, Global Utmaning, Global Challenges, has tried for all its life for 15 years to put climate warning, warming and climate policy, climate action, on the top of the government's agenda. But I'm sorry to say, we have not succeeded so well. Uh, 1992, the UN had a meeting where all the UN members, or more or less all the UN members, signed a convention that to stop climate warming. That was 30 years ago, it was almost 30 years ago. And then everything went on as usual. Business as usual, nothing happened, really, nothing happened. Not on a global scale. Sweden has done some, but I'm sorry to say that the uh, emissions have ceased to diminish. The, over the last three years, it has been more or less uh, zero change. And uh, at the same time, we have tried all the time, not only to borrow it morning, but this year we decided that we couldn't wait any longer for the government, the Swedish government, to take action. So we decided to do it ourselves, to produce a strategic plan and an action plan for change, and to do everything in our power to convince the decision makers and, of course, the citizens to support the plan and to implement the plan. So this is the work that we, we have decided. And tonight at this seminar, we have uh, called together some of the key persons in this work that is starting now. And um, I will present them to you very soon. I just would like to say that we live in a state of emergency. The, UN, the EU Parliament is so right. Only some ye 10 years remain until it will be too late to stop temperature from rising to more than two degrees. And we don't know the effect of this change. We know that the consequences for the world economy will be very serious. And uh, we know that Sweden, cold countries in the north like Sweden, will also be hard affected, seriously affected. We are very dependent on trade, very dependent on exports and imports. And uh, it's hard to say exactly what will happen. We just know that stability, welfare and stability, and eventually our civilization and democracy will be at risk. And of course, this must not happen. We must do literally everything that is in our power to stop this from happening. And that's why we meet in Madrid, and that's why we meet here tonight, and that's why we are starting our action plan. We call it the super climate plan. In relation to other plans, it will be super. We are in the beginning of this work, and uh, we will be happy to come back to you, wherever you are, Madrid or Stockholm, and tell you more about what we are going to do. So we will start to have a presentation of the state of the climate in the world. And we have two speakers. We have Ingmar Rensog, who is the chair of Global Utmaning, and also the founder of We Don't Have Time, a social climate network. And then after Ingmar will Stefan Lestadius, who is professor at KTH, KTH, uh, the Royal Swedish Technology, uh, Institute of Technology University and also the chair of uh, the Swedish or Global Utmaning Council for Climate and Resources. So, let's start to have a, get a briefing on the state of affairs of the climate and climate policy. Please, Ingmar, you go ahead. 
I'm sorry, yes, I completely forget. Uh, <laughs> we are supposed to have a youth perspective on the discussions in Madrid. And uh, to that event, we have therefore a Swedish representative from the youth, from the LSU. That is Ludwig uh, uh, Bengtsson, who is with us today. Hello, Ludwig, I'll see you. Do you see me? <laughs> yes, hi. And Ludwig, we will be happy to get your comments on what is happening right now in Madrid and what you expect to happen. Will there be a youth perspective? Because if there is a youth perspective in Madrid, it means radical and ambitious action that will be decided upon and then taken by the participants in Madrid. Do you expect that to happen? Please, Ludwig, the floor is yours. Thank you, Christina. Uh, happy that you remembered youth. Uh, often we are forgotten. Uh, <laughs> when I got this brief, I was asked, uh, how could we better include youth in climate politics and in climate negotiations? So I asked the youth who are here uh, for consultations and uh, prepared a brief statement. Uh, the science is clear that if we don't make immediate cuts to emissions, our lives and environmental integrity of the planet is at stake. We risk our homes to extreme weather and sea level rise. We risk our food production to droughts and a species extinction. We risk our health to air pollution and heat waves. And we, the youth, we know this. We can't escape that the, the fact that our futures are being written in rooms such as this. It stands abundantly clear that despite valiant efforts from many states, emissions are still rising. And this is completely unacceptable. It is a crisis, it is an emergency, and it is a catastrophe. And knowing what we know, youth can provide valuable insights on how to turn the tide. During the Secretary General's Climate Action Summit this past September, several countries, include, including Sweden and Norway, uh, signed the Kwangesh Climate Pledge. In it, uh, it states that those signatories have committed to taking youth perspectives into consideration when implementing the Paris Agreement. And so this includes when drafting nationally determined contributions, long-term long greenhouse gas emission strategies and adaption strategies. So they have signed up to take our perspective on these things. And the key thing here is to include us at an early stage, not when the plans are already set for consultations. Let us instead tell you what science says we need to do for us to have a livable future. Let us tell you the adverse effects of an unjust policy. And let us then work together uh, from that point to ensure that we create a future that inspires us with hope instead of dread. And when it comes to ambition, uh, the NDCs are set to be updated during the next year. And this really is the best opportunity we have uh, on an international arena to set us on the path to 1.5 degrees. And here we as young people really can use this opportunity to leverage the power we have gotten uh, over the last years uh, to push our governments and in the case of Sweden, the EU, to enhance their NDCs, set ambitious short-term goals as well as long-term goals. And the NDCs are not an agenda item per se, as we heard from the Danish delegation previously. But the climate doesn't care if it's on the agenda or not. It puts itself on the agenda. Uh, and that's where we really need to work. Thank you. Thank you, Ludwig. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, now I give the floor to Ingmar Rensel. Please, Ingmar. Thank you. Can I turn this off? Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I used to work in the finance industry. But there was a man that changed my mind, and this is the man. Uh, when Donald Trump got elected in the U.S. election, uh, it, got me it got me realized that our world leaders, they're not acting on the climate crisis. And it doesn't matter if it's U.S. president or the Swedish prime minister, it's the same in the whole world. Our leaders doesn't act on this crisis. So I sold my old company, and today I work full time with the climate crisis and solutions. And exactly one year ago, I was standing on this stage together with my colleagues from Global Utmaning and We Not Have Time, where we launched the 
climate emergency plan from the Club of Rome. And it looks like this. I want you to listen very carefully. We used to talk about climate change as something in the future, but it's with us now. We must move fast. This is zero hour to act on, on climate change. Human beings and the natural world are on a collision course. The world is on track to be unlivable. The anxiety was eating me. The largest segment is either not very or fairly just a little bit concerned. This is not a dream. I used to have to go out and search the past few years to find all the slides I'd need for a presentation. Yeah, I can tell you that Californians are feeling the pain right now. And now, all within 2018 and final. We have been seeing in the last decades droughts. Uh, the summer season is becoming hotter and longer and drier. When forests get dry, they burn. California earlier this year, Greece, Japan not known for its wildfires, Siberia, the United Kingdom, again in California, still burning. It's crucial that we who understand the urgency start to act. I say get angry, get very angry. There's an insane focus on just more and more and more, and that is killing us. Humanity is always much too slow in reacting. Do something about it. Take action. Because if we run, others will follow. Perhaps you've heard of the old acronym NIMBY, N-I-M-B-Y, not in my backyard. A new one that I was made aware of a couple of weeks ago, NIMTO, not in my term of office. Today, our World leaders are actually, they are talking about the climate crisis, but they still don't act on it. And that's why we need a climate plan. That's why we need action, and we need it now. And the reason for that, I would like to just explain the background why this is so important. Uh, what you see here is the thin layer that's called the atmosphere. All life on Earth depends on this really, really thin layer that is healthy. But we don't treat this so good. Instead, we just use it as an open sewer. And we put out a lot of greenhouse gases out there. The most common one is carbon dioxide. And as you can see here, it's growing, growing, growing for every year, and it doesn't stop. And the problem with this is that what we put up there also stay up there for a very long time. And when people talk about the problem, people often forget to mention that it is not enough to stop the emissions. We also need to put back what we already had put up there. And you can see this very clearly in this picture. If you take a long time period of 800,000 years, we have never seen as high level of carbon dioxide as we see today. This is absurd, and we're only seeing the beginning of the effects of the levels in the atmosphere we have today. So if we stop everything, we still have a big problem to solve. This changes the mindset we need to solve this crisis. We can't just solve the crisis by stop doing things. We need to start doing the right things. That's very important. It's not enough to stop doing things. We need to start the action of doing the right things. And the problem with high level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere uh, is, as you know, that it will turn very hot here on Earth. And the fifth warmest years ever measured by humans on this Earth has also been the fifth latest years. 
But the problem with this two degrees target and, and the talk about it is that people still don't get how severe this problem is. And I think that is because we don't communicate this in, in the right way. If it is two degrees hotter outside here today in Stockholm in December, I think that all of us here will think that that would be nice, not something bad. But in, if you instead think of your body temperature, the fact is that we today, all humans on Earth, have fewer. We have 48 degrees in our body, and we're not feeling so well. We're one degree above the mean temperature, the normal Earth temperature. So when you hear someone talking about 1.5 degrees, 2 degrees, etc., translate that to your body temperature. And as we know, we're heading for at least 3 degrees. That's 40 degrees fewer. That's bad news. And when you get fever, you also feel sick and feel symptoms. And one of those symptoms is that it's getting very hot outside. Last summer in 2018, we had 80 forest fires here in Sweden, a northern country. That's very unusual. And this is a picture of one of the first ones. I was driving in the car right uh, behind that bus. And last summer was very, very hot. In Sweden, we had the hottest May, June, July, and August. We practically had no rain for a whole summer. But this year, people have forgotten this. Because this year, it was a normal, rainy, cold summer here in northern Sweden. But in the rest of Europe, they had a really, really hot temperature. And it was, it was not just Europe. Paris, 46 degrees. India, 50 degrees. Kuwait, 52 degrees. Saudi Arabia, 55 degrees. And I could go on. So many, many heat records was broken this year. But now you may think that, can't you find heat records somewhere in the world? Is that the proof of climate changing? If the climate are supposed to be stable, and it is, it should be about the same cold records compared to heat records. And if you look into the statistic last year, we had 40 cold records in the world compared to 430 heat records. It's very hard to be a climate denier those days. The problem with the heating is also that the heat is not just heating the land, it's also heating the ocean. 93% of the energy is stored in the ocean. And when the ocean heats, you will see those things. The energy needs to get away somewhere. So we will see a lot of more extreme weathers. And if you look into the reinsurance industry, in 40 years, extreme weather has increased 300%. And this is just looking back, not looking forward. And it's not just extreme weather that is threatening us. I think you all have also, also heard about tipping points. And this is just one example of a tipping point. This is frozen methane gases in the Arctic, in the Siberia tundra. And what you see here is that it's melting. And the problem with that is that methane gases is much more potent greenhouse gases. And what could happen is that we could trigger a chain reaction where this melts, it got hotter, and it melts even more, and we humans can't do anything about it. And just to demonstrate what that guy in Russia are standing on is this. This is what happens when it explodes, because methane is very explosive. And it's not just methane gases, it's also human chain reaction that are and could be an even bigger problem. I'm talking about climate refugees. There are studies out there talking about that the world could see one billion climate 
migrants in 40 years. 40 years. So even if you live in a country, maybe Sweden, we don't know, where you still could grow food, it wouldn't be so pleasant because everyone would like to move there and it will be really crowded. So this is a big problem today and even bigger in the future. But the thing is, we have the solutions. We can solve this. It doesn't need to happen in this way. And that's why we are here. We don't have time, but we still have time to act. And I would like to just exemplify this with another big environmental catastrophe that the world actually has solved. I'm talking about the ozone layer that Freons threatened. And 40 years ago, the world leaders came together and forbid these gases to be used. I don't think you miss Freons today. We live perfect lives without Freons in our daily life. But if they didn't have solved this 40 years ago, we here today couldn't go outside without covering our skin. So this was a huge problem that the world actually solved. And the good news is that we have a start of the climate crisis. All countries on Earth has agreed that we have a problem and that we need to stay under 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius. But we're still not acting on it. And what this seminar is all about is that we don't need to wait for political system. We can make the change ourselves. And I firmly believe that the solution are in the businesses. And this is just one example of 190 companies, companies global companies, that has pledged to only use 100% renewable energy. So if our world leaders doesn't act, we need to act. And that's my message. Thank you, Mark. And um, <clears throat> now Stefan will give us his picture, which uh, has the same basic message, but maybe yeah. in a little bit more scientific yeah, language. Hopefully. Yeah. Anyhow, uh, yeah, let's start from the beginning. This has been a dark year, and my knowledge sources here, which I based my presentation on, are all these international reports. I think there are about 10 or something, and they all show the same picture. So these are the basics for, for, for my presentation today. Uh, Let's start with the temperature increase, as you probably know, and this is the background for the Madrid meeting. This, uh, this was shown last year uh, from the IPCC report. What you see here is, on, on the one hand, global temperature is increasing, but you also see that the rate of increase is increasing, and you also see there is no, no signs that it is leveling off. That is the basic reason for the Madrid discussions today. You see over there also what uh, Ingmar talked about. This is the temperature or the fever of the the globe. The more red it is, the higher is the fever. And what you see, it's higher up there in the north than the average. Uh, today, or last year, the fever was 1.16 degrees centigrade above what it should be compared to uh, what it was 150 years ago. And this, of course, is related to carbon dioxide emissions. What you see here is the increase of carbon dioxide emissions after the Second World War. We call that the Great Acceleration. And the impact of that is, of course, it is the surface under that which creates the greenhouse effect. And what you see here is, basically, with this rate of increase, 50% of all global emissions have occurred after 1990. That is the importance of it. What you see here also is what is happening just now. Um, and um, in fact, last year, I think that is the most alarming thing, is last year you reached all-time high as re regards the level of carbon dioxide emissions. It was also more or less the all-time high as regards the rate of increase. It was the second highest rate of increase uh, of carbon dioxide emissions. And that occurs after, should we call it, about 30 years of international negotiations. In fact, I think this Madrid meeting is the 70th. We have had 70 international climate meetings during this, since about 1990. During this period, the carbon dioxide emissions have increased with about 60%. 
more or less 1% per meeting. And uh, last year, it was probably 2% two two increase. There is some divergence on International Energy Agency's estimates and British Petroleum and also what this research institute has got. But roughly 2% increase last year. A lot of data here, but just focus on this one. These are the important things. I've taken them from British Petroleum statistics. What you see here is that in the relation between the ratio and the relation between the increase of fossil fuels last year in relation to the increase of renewables. You see that in the United States, the increase of fossil fuels is 7.5 times as large as the increase of renewables. In China, the increase is, which is leading in renewables. The increase in fossil fuels is only 2.6 times as fast as the increase of renewables. On a global level, you see more or less the increase last year on the use of fossil fuels is roughly four times as large as the increase of renewables. That is basically the 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 result last year. This is taken from the British Petroleum Statistics. You have a question, a very short one, because I have a very short person. Uh, this, is capacity or is it this is the actual consumption. Um, and this co has contributed to a situation now when the material metabolism is higher than ever on global level. We have never industrialized and transported and manufactured so much material as we do now. It is, the, it is doubling every 25 years. And in the relation to that, even the fossil use is higher than ever. It's doubling every 25 years. And we are still on that track, and that means that half of all emissions have occurred during the last 25 years. There, there are some data showing the, that the, you have a similar situation in Sweden. Uh, there has been some leveling off, but last year, 2018, in fact, our emissions from Sweden increased also. Uh, this is the report published just some days ago, uh, some weeks ago, and it shows it is from the United Nations Environmental Program, and it is available now in the negotiations in Madrid. What you see here is uh, what you have to do here to, to, to reduce the emissions if you want to go to the 1.5 centigrade target. This is 1.8. I think this is more realistic. I don't think we can reach that. And this is the two centigrade target. And this is the way we are moving now. And um, uh, this means, and I have another picture here, we are now moving towards a global temperature increase somewhere between four and a half and three and a half centigrades in the end of this century, if you do nothing. And there are no indications that we are doing anything. At least we can't find it in the statistics. Uh, Christina Figueres, who was the leading figure in the Paris negotiations some years ago, she and some other researchers, including Johan Rockström, published this paper in Nature 2017. It is the same thing. This is the way the carbon dioxide emissions are increasing. These are the strategies we have to go if we want to keep the temperature below 1.5 centigrades. And we are not on that track now. So, in summary, we are heading towards a catastrophe. Not for the planet, but for mankind and human society. Uh, and uh, I will summarize this to say, this is not primarily a question of energy and energy production. This is a question of our belief that man is ma mastering nature. It is a, uh, a question of our belief that we have the idea of progress, that everything is progressing. This is our understanding of growth, our understanding of time, what is the normal time to transport ourselves. It on our views of welfare, which is deeply related in a symbiotic relation to fossil fuels. This is of, of the basic things. The, it is not primarily a question of technology fix or a question of just uh, change, switching something in the energy production. This is a fundamental crisis rather than a pure energy crisis. So that means we have to act against this background. That means we have to make proactive things and reactive to keep what is already too late to change. It is a question of top-down strategies are not enough. 
after 70 international negotiations or conferences, there is no single, we haven't sold anything. We must also start a bottom-up strategy on an individual, local, and national level. That is what our climate plan is about. It, uh, there is a need for individual change, not only from on social level. And because we are all small, we must rely our strategies on the dynamics of climate activists. We start and others will follow. That is the basic strategy. We have to have a 7% reduction. I thought I was really, how to say, very extreme on that belief just yeah, some weeks ago, but now I can recognize that the United Nations Environmental Program is moving towards 7.5% annual carbon dioxide emission reductions. It's an enormous target and it is necessary. And we have to calibrate a complex system related to this. And I think this is one of the aims of the plans we are doing now. Uh, with, uh, global Earth Morning is having now, trying to calibrate all these things to obtain a reduction of about 7% a year. And it is important to create this plan, to create a narrative, to convince people that it is possible. Now it seems too overwhelming, it seems too much, we can't do it, and that means we must create a picture, a narrative showing it is possible if you do this, that, and that. I think this is the important target with the work we are planning to do. So we must create narratives with high credibility. We can't end up just with, with um, apocalyptic visions. So our work, with the climate plan is a means to turn away from the present catastrophe course to a path of hope and of alternatives in a situation when we lack a strong political leadership. Our politicians need help, and so do we. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. We have all the insights about the dangers of what is happening right now. And we have all the technology, we have all the money, the economy that is needed. We have the institutions in many countries, especially in countries like uh, Sweden, to go ahead and change and make change. But we are not doing it. This could be the theme for one new seminar. Why are we not doing enough? But we will do our best to make the actors, the Swedish political actors, because the truth is that we need both business and politicians to act, and the support from citizens to make the politicians dare to take action. And um, now we move over to uh, what should be done. How could it be done? We have the instruments, we have the knowledge. Um, Peter Folke, you work at Material Economics, uh, Material Economics is uh, a consultancy firm that started a few years ago, uh, specializing in material resources, circular economy, and climate mitigation, climate policies. And you have been doing plenty of work in other countries. And I won't go further into all your merits. Uh, you are the project man one of the project managers at Material Economics, Peter. So I give you the floor to tell us a little bit about what will be the content of our, the, clim the, the super climate plan that uh, Global Youth Morning is now launching uh, or re starting the work to uh, formulate. Please, Peter. Floor Thank you. Yours. Hi. Uh, I will talk to you about the climate plan and more specifically, why does it need to be an integrated climate plan? And, and why do we even need it? So first, if we take one step back. As you all know, uh, I think, at least, um, since, since the 90s, we've seen a pretty good ride in Sweden. Uh, we've seen uh, emission reductions uh, for almost two decades, largely thanks to renewable energy, heat, and, and energy efficiency. But as we've heard earlier today, uh, for the last, uh, last uh, two, three years, the reductions has uh, almost stopped. 53 million tons remains. Uh, and how do we cut those down? Well, the, the first thing to answer that question is, what do they consist of? And it's not that much. 
It's basically 10 different things that represent 80% of all our emissions. It's within transportation, industry, agriculture, and a few other things. And it's, it's your usual suspects. It's the, it's the cars and the trucks, the iron and the steel making, it's the cement and concrete, it's the refineries, it's the chemistry, i.e. plastics, no, it's, the, it's the farmland, the animal digestion, it's the district heating and the machines. Okay, it sounds a lot when I say it like that, right? It's, uh, but it's only 10 things. And, and it's, the good thing is that we, the technical solutions to solving each of these sectors is already here or almost here. With a few exceptions, but, uh, but most of them. So what does this tell us? It tells us that we're going out of a first phase. In a first phase where we focused on um, energy and heat, and we focused on what we call transportation part one, biofuels. N what we need to do now is transportation part two, which is electrification and new mobility and logistics systems, and we need to transform industry. It, it always seemed impossible, but it's not. You have new industrial processes, and I'll, I'll, uh, I might jump into a couple of them later. Uh, you have biomaterials that you can use as feedstock. You have CCS. It might be expensive, but it's still there. And, and then we have some additional measures um, that we need to take. You know, new methods within agriculture. Agriculture is one of the trickiest ones to, to, to beat, actually. But then to make it net neutral, which we want to do, you can still use carbon sinks and circular economy business models. Hasn't anyone tried to look at how do we do this, the phase two? Of course, a lot of, uh, a lot of people have tried to, to solve this. And we have, uh, we have uh, almost uh, a, a, ton of, uh, a ton of research on, uh, on this. And, and um, I just laid out a few of them here on this page. Uh, the Fossil Fit Sverige, the Vägvar for, for Klimatet by, by Royal Academy of Engineering Sciences. We have Klimatpolitiska Rådet who, re who releases their reports. We have from Svensk Näringsliv and Sveco did a, uh, did a calculation of how much bio uh, resources uh, are we claiming. But what these basically do is they look at, us, usually at least, they look at one sector and, and see how do, we, how do we solve this sector. And, and there's a problem with that, and I'll come back to this. Um, but, but before I get to, uh, f to, 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 to the problem with looking at one sector, I'm going to tell you why we need to look at them all together. Um, and this is the, the, the key part of, of my uh, speech today, is, is our presentation today, is the need for an integrated climate plan. So what we need to do is first, number zero actually, uh, we need to update uh, the sector-specific roadmaps late on, le based on the latest technical progress. And that's because things are moving fast. Technology is moving really fast. And then I'm talk uh, talking about things like, 10 years ago, you wouldn't think that you could electrify out of the transportation problem. But today, we're pretty sure that we can. We're talking about things like chemical recycling that could solve the plastics problem. Uh, and, and, and there's a bunch of other things. But then, what we also need to do, instead of just updating the roadmaps, we need to look at the holistic picture, and we need to quantify stuff. And, and uh, that, that's my number one here. And basically what that means is that if you ask a certain sector or a certain company, and, and uh, I'm out there talking with a lot of these companies, the, the easy solution, I'm not saying it's that easy, but the easy solution is to say, oh, we'll use biofuels, we'll use bioresources. And a lot of people are saying that. But if you sum them up, I'm not sure we have enough of them. Uh, the same thing if, you, if you're thinking about, no, but, but let's, let's, do, uh, let's then electrify everything. So if we, if we add up the numbers and how much electricity will we need, I'm not sure we have it. And uh, we definitely don't have the capacity in, uh, in our, in our trans transmission lines to support that. So you need the complete picture, you need to quantify it across sectors to really say something. Um, the second thing uh, here, 
is a few cross-cutting themes where you're not just you know, summing it up and looking at the, adding the sectors together, but you're looking at how, how can they actually help each other. And you know, uh, the, the infrastructure, uh, something that goes across sectors. Um, circular economy and sustainable consumption, for sure. And then thirdly, uh, we need a transition plan uh, for policy and also um, a very clear view on what does policy need to accomplish. Uh, for instance, um, when you go into a new type of technology, uh, I'm sure a lot, of, a lot of you have read about the steel industry. Can you produce it with hydrogen instead of the old Swedish classic production method? Um, that might be a bit more expensive, but so what can policy do to actually make it cost competitive so that companies can transfer over there? Uh, and there, there's uh, all other, all other um, things that, that policy need to think about. I listed just a few of them here. Um, but let, let me give you the, the, one, uh, the one example that I talked about earlier before I hand over. And that's about uh, transportation and biofuels. How much biofuel do we need in road transport 2030 in Sweden? It's not an easy question. And if you look at a few of the premier reports that have been released in Sweden, it's obviously not an easy question. Because the estimations is from 40 terawatt hour down to 10. If you look at just a few, uh, you see the sources here. And, and uh, nothing against the, the, the reports, but it's, you know, it's a tricky question. Hence the need to understand what else can we, should we use bioresources for? Can we put everything into, into transportation? Uh, I talked about electrification. That's for sure an option for, uh, option for cars, but maybe not for trucks. Or is it? It could actually be cost comparative by 2027 to internal combustion engines. We're not there yet, we don't know, but we could, could we get there. And if you, if you then start to think about the transportation sector, should we then use electricity or should we use biofuel or should we use both? It helps to add up the picture. And this is just, uh, I won't go into all the details because it's a, a, a bit of a um, heavy picture. But here we just did a very first estimation. You need to do this even more properly. But, but when we add up the numbers on the claims and the demand uh, and the supply in Swedish forest. It doesn't really add up. So what we have on the right hand side is the potential future supply. The light gray is what we're, what we're producing sustainably and using today. Or we're harvesting sustainably and using today. And here we, were even, we even added up the potential future supply by you know, additional use of bioproducts. If, if, uh, if a hotter climate makes forests grow faster, you know, we all added all those things up. And some of them are quite controversial, like intensifying forestry at the cost of biodiversity, uh, perhaps. And then you look at the left-hand side. We're just adding up you know, what we have today, growth in pulp production, and also uh, use in transportation and industry, and et cetera, et cetera. So the equation doesn't add up. So someone needs to look at this uh, with a holistic picture. And that's why we need the integrated climate plan that we're, that we're thinking about. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. <clears throat> a concrete plan telling us how we shall reach the goals, and an integrated plan that will give the complete picture and how they fit together, how they are, go together, coordinated. And when we have that plan, problems won't be solved. We need to communicate it, and we need to have a pedagogical uh, presentation and to reach out to politicians and to uh, citizens uh, in general, uh, the whole society. And that is where climate view comes into the picture. This is the, uh, what Pedro to told us about was the, the content of the plan, the parts of it at least, and. Uh, and uh, the analysis that need to be done. And what um, Tom and Shalit, who is the CEO of uh, Climate View and the inventor of this uh, uh, software instrument called uh, Panorama and used by the uh, Climate Council, Climate Policy uh, Climate Policy Council, uh, also to present the situation up to today. Uh, we will use it to add on the future, to have a future uh, picture 
uh, and using panorama as the basis. So please, Tomer, the inventor of uh, this uh, instrument and the CEO. Thank you. We believe this can be solved. But as Stefan was saying, this has to be solved together. Top down, government, bottom up, citizens, companies, we have to solve this together. And if you want to solve something together, you need a common language. You need a way to have, share the picture, understand where you are. And we also need a way to subdivide this enormous complexity into small, handleable parts so that we can actually start tackling it and actually see that some things, some things are going in the right direction and speed those things up. So as a starting point for the, um, for the uh, Super Climate Plan, we are we have actually got a very, very powerful building block from the Swedish government with the Swedish Energy Agency, the Climate Policy Council, and the Nat Environmental Protection Agency, who has built a panorama, which is a way to overview and see Sweden's entire climate policy and see where we're at, how we're doing, where the gaps are, and what's actually been done. So Panorama gives us a joint picture. Now, this is complete open data. This is on the web. You can go and check it out today at the Climate Policy Council. And it's an open website where anyone can go. And I'll dive into it. So basically here, we're summarizing Sweden's climate policy, our territorial emissions, the ones that we have to get down for the Paris Agreement. So you see the top half there, we have Sweden's greenhouse gas emissions, 53 million tons. We have the potentials of how we solve those emissions, how we reduce them. We have indicators and trends showing how things are actually are doing. And then we have all the policies and actions done by government to try and make this happen. So I'll dive in. So you see the width here. We have the different um, emissions. As we were talking about before, we have the transport, we have the industry, we have agriculture, we have energy. The width here representing Sweden's emissions, as we are reporting to the IPCC. A total of 53 million tons today. We'll know the next the years for this year, year and a few weeks. So let's dive down into one of the areas, transport. So there we see Sweden's uh, transport is spread by passenger transport, the largest width, and then we have goods transport, and we have other stuff. I'll tell you already here, a lot of people that's actually sort of should know, get surprised at how large a part of Sweden's emissions are actually passenger transports, which is surprising that people don't know, but also it's quite positive because we've just heard that's actually a solvable problem. At least a lot of the solution is there. So how are we going to solve it? Well, let's dive down. And here we start seeing the solutions and the width here again describing where the impact of the solutions are. We have reduced energy usage and we have renewable fuels. As you see, a large part of this is actually by reducing the energy uses for passenger transport. So what do we mean by that? Well, it's what we call a transport efficient society. How do we change society so they use less energy? Well, reduced transport by car is by far the biggest part to making people shift from driving cars to other transportation modes. So how does that happen? Well, largest part there is increased proportion on public transport. We all know this, and you see here that actually, if you look at increased proportion of public transport, that's, there's a potential there. 3% of Sweden's emissions is us actually going, uh, just us in cities who have access to public transport, using more public transport. So let's go in and see about how that could look. So if we go from about 10% today of work, trans work transportation, uh, by, pu uh, uh, by public transport to going something like 19% by 2030. That's basically following that turquoise line there. We reduce 3% of Sweden's emissions. Downside here, the black line there is going, that's the actual outcome. That's how things are going just now. We're actually heading in the wrong direction. We have been heading in the right direction, we're suddenly dipping. But we see there where the gap is just now. It's not a projection in the future. The gap just now is 18% off target. So what's happening to do something about this? Well, here we see the Swedish law. We have approved laws. We have completed, but not yet implemented. And then the bottom there, we have suggestions. And here's the most important part. Here, it's open for suggestions. And what the Swedish Climate Policy Council is doing with Panorama 
is opening up this platform, which is open data, for parties like Global Ut Morning to start coming with suggestions on what we can do about this, so that we together are sharing the same picture where the gaps are, and together can come with suggestions, detail them, and explain them. So that way, we have a joint picture of Sweden's entire transition, shared by everyone, clearly communicated, that all parties of society can start agreeing upon and start seeing, seeing things such as, hang on, everyone is using biofuel. That's a problem. You can see that here. And it's all open data, and therefore open for society, so we can work top-down, bottom-up, together. Thank you. And Tomer, those yellow uh, dots that you have there, that's public suggestions, that public proposals, public committees. In yes, so yes. the yellow ones are the ones currently by government. And what's happening now with the platform, it will open up. So there will be blue dots, which are from civil society, from movements, which can come with their own suggestions. So when we have worked for some time, we will start adding blue dots to this picture yes. and show how we gradually will shrink these gaps until they become zero. Yes. So and we will project the development and also the effects of policy decisions that we take and, 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 and changes that we assess. Exactly. And we'll also be able to see the gaps. And the gaps just now, they, they don't have to be arguments. They are facts. The gaps mm. are not gaps of projections of the future of where we might be, which is obviously a subjective argument, but the gaps we're showing just now are the gaps of where we are just now off track, so that we have the, f the fact, a fact base to stand upon, so that when we come with arguments, and we'll have different opinions on how to solve the gaps, we don't have to argue about the facts. They are there. And, good. and now we are um, establishing this project, we are organizing it, and we are recruiting our, the finance for it because as you can well understand, this is not for free. To have very qualified people to work together, Global Earth Morning, uh, Material Economics and Climate View in one organization, and to show how Sweden should go ahead to, to reach the climate goals. We are far from doing it now, and we, we will show how it could be done, and we'll do what we can to convince uh, politicians and all others to... to, to uh, uh, accept and, uh, and implement our recommendations. And um, <coughs> we have among our um, potential and likely, uh, I should say, uh, partners in this work, we have the Swedish trade union movement and we have a number of companies who are interested to support this, uh, uh, this work. And um, are you... This one? Okay. So that was Panorama Sweden, and that was us. And so what we are going to do, we, first of all, the need is to, uh, to have this integrated and ambitious plan for climate action. And having that, we will be the drivers on the cli Swedish climate goals and reach carbon neutrality by uh, 2045. And it will be anchored in the business community. We will have con constant consultations with the relevant companies, the most relevant companies. I learned today that SSAB, with the, their hybrid, hybrid project, they thought that they would reach carbon neutrality in their uh, project in 2045. But now they say it could be reached already 2027. So uh, technology is moving ahead very, very quickly, which will ease, which make our task, this, the task of the world, much, much easier. So by this work that we are going to do, or just started to, to do, is we will accelerate Sweden's uh, transformation, uh, and we will facilitate uh, with the communication work together with the trade unions, uh, get a broad support and understanding of the necessity of change. And we will add to it also the, if this is green, we need also red color in this change because we have to look at the distributional effects. 
we have to have the social effects and we have to meet the effects of people for people living in, 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 um, in very remote areas where there are no alternatives in communication, for instance. So there has to be that content, content also in our plan. And when we talk about deliveries, cooperation is, co of course, that part of the communication work. And we will work with scenarios, various scenarios, to present various roads to reach the tar targets. And um, by doing this, and doing in this, in, in uh, this broad communication uh, strategy, uh, we will hope that we will also contribute to a political consensus about the road forward to reach the target. The, the, the climate goals. So this is us doing the work, and uh, our strength is our combination of different skills and our broad networks. And when we feel ready for it, we will also reach out to the outside world. We we'll translate what we're doing, because what m much of what Sweden could do could be done and is needed to be done also in other countries because it's not enough with Sweden transformating. We all have to do it. And some countries have bigger difficulties in achieving transformation than Sweden has. So we have a responsibility for the outside world. And these are the stages. We are in stage one right now, the financing and the organizing stage. We will start by collecting uh, existing data and evaluate existing data. And we will continue to stage three and develop the policy action needed, and uh, start the, the communication work. We formulate a super climate plan, and we have a dialogue with policy uh, makers. We will probably have a dialogue with each party at a time to start with. Uh, and uh, we will then, of course, as the last stage, stage four, launch the super climate plan, and we'll present it at COP. <laughs> Maybe the first version will be already in COP26, and then in COP27 it will be the final version, or final. Maybe nothing is ever final <laughs> in this world. It will be something that we will continue to work on, but then more in a, in a more, uh, in a more um, administrative way, uh, adding up new, new facts. So that is the work that we, in very, very short terms, that we are planning. And now I would like to have the final comment from our uh, youth representative in Madrid, uh, <laughs> Ludwig Bengtsson Sunesson. Hi again. Now you have listened to what we are planning. It is in very, uh, very, very summarized everything. But do you feel a little bit uh, more uh, uh, secure that there might be a change coming from this Madrid meeting and that maybe we could add to it? in our work? Well, I mean, thank you for this presentation. It was fascinating to see all the ideas you had. I had several points I wanted to comment on, but right here at the end, uh, you swooped them up and made sure to include uh, civil society uh, and other parties in the discussion. Because, I mean, I'm not, I haven't given up on multilateralism as much as Ingmar seems to have yet, <laughs> because the thing with these processes is that people get to have an input, whether you're a small island state or if you're a developing nation, developed nation. And I think you need, really need to take that into consideration when drafting this so you know the effects these changes will have on people. And then the second point, uh, Amitav Ghosh, the author, has said that we're in a crisis of imagination when it comes to climate change. And I really think that's true. We have trouble imagining what all these changes will do to our daily lives and our experiences of living on this planet. And that also connects to what Stefan was saying, that we need to have this cultural shift. And I really think you need to look at that as well. How can you use different methods of storytelling to convey what the life will be like during under this society that you propose in the super climate plan? And try to be, try to be creative with it. Uh, create something that people can actually relate to and then make them feel emotion because I, I find it really fascinating to listen to material economics presentation about these different technologies and all that, but maybe don't. Maybe that doesn't appeal to everyone. Maybe you need something else to appeal to them, because we all need to get behind this for it to actually have legitimacy when it's implemented. But thank you for this opportunity to uh, comment on and uh, hear what you're doing. 
I look forward to at next COP then, see the climate plan, right? <laughs> yes. Thank you, Ludwig, for your comments. And we look forward to working with the youth of Sweden in this climate plan. And uh, I'm sure that uh, we could do a lot together when it comes to formulating the nar nar narratives that we need to feel, the co feel confident about the future. Because what is, what is the worst for people, uh, and that is the danger for democracy, is when people don't have faith in the future. We must create faith in the future, and that is something we could do together. Yeah, we, that we agree some on. of us very old, some very young. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you so much, Ludwig. And uh, to all of you, time is out. I see <laughs> Mary is looking oh, at me. Here, okay, so we have time for that. Great, I thought you would cut down everything at, uh, all right. So, questions. We are happy to have some back there, please. Give your name and then your question. Uh, yes, you there, exactly. Yeah, hi, I'm Jonas. I'm from Regeneration 2030, and I'm also a, something of a youth representative, I guess. And <laughs> I want to know, um, after these magnificent presentations and useful uh, ideas we are b being shown and uh, seeing this super climate plan where you mention all the experts and all the funding and the fields, uh, I see no room for, for youth in that plan, except for the mentioning of Ludwig in the end, <laughs> and, then ex and, then, and then saying, well, let's work together in the future. And I'm wondering, how can I get in on that now? <laughs> Where's the room for me? Uh, I'm sure there's room somewhere. Can you elaborate on that, please? Join us. <laughs> we're very open for more partners. Everybody, so, everyone yes, is open. We, we're, uh, you're, uh, just talk to us, we're really interested in that. We will formulate a number of reference groups. We have experts, and some will be old, some will be young, but then we will have other groups as well, and we have a lot of activities that we hope to, to, uh, to uh, carry out together with uh, trade unions in education and discussion, dialogue, dialogue with people, and I expect that many of the people wanting to take part will be young. I hope. <laughs> okay, somebody up there? Yes, yeah. please. Uh, hi, so I'm Eva Engström and I work at Vinova and also studying a bit here now. Uh, but my question, because I've seen this uh, panorama presentation before at my work, and I understand that at the moment this is only covering emissions within Sweden and not outside. And I understand that at the moment countries only measure within their countries, uh, whether it's Sweden or it's Bangladesh or so forth. But I'm wondering if we talk of actual responsibility and Sweden having all of these resources, shouldn't we actually then be phasing in the part of measuring our external emissions? I, I don't see how we can talk <coughs> about actual responsibility when we're not doing this yet. Yeah. Stefan, would you like to comment on that? Uh, or yeah, Tomer? Not, am I on? You are correct. That should be done. <laughs> and I think it... <laughs> but we have the... Yeah, but, uh, first of all, uh, uh, you can always integrate that in, uh, in the panorama plan as far as I have understood it. Uh, that's the first thing. Second, uh, it necessitates a lot of statistical work because it is, it is a tricky work to identify these kind of things with, with some precision. But I agree it should be done, and I believe it can be done. And could it be done by Panorama? Yeah, we, now we actually t totally agree. And uh, on the national level, well, that's because it's the Paris Agreement. So that's so. But if we look at cities and doing the same thing, Obviously, consumption data is really important. And it's, it, as you say, it's not, statistically, it's, it's harder, but it do, that doesn't really matter. It's like we, we want to see the big proportions and where we can do stuff. So yes, we should do consumption, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I'd like okay. just to hear whether Madrid might have a question. No? Uh, I'm not quite sure. I'm, uh, to, to those of you in, in, uh, in Stockholm, I'm Andre Amholt. I'm uh, on stage with Ludwig here to, to facilitate the, the um, audience here in Madrid. Um, are there any questions from the audience in Madrid? No. I, though, actually have a question because uh, the young girl who was uh, talking or asking questions earlier on, she, she wanted to go international or, or measure every country together. I was kind of curious to Panorama if it's also possible to go the other way because we do know that it all comes down to us as individuals. 
to kind of measure or make, make us a tool so that we could each measure our own impression, if you like, to, to go the other way around. I don't, know, I don't know if you have ever thought of it, but I'm asking the question. Well, I think that there, are couple, there are a couple of very good tools for measuring, measuring your own uh, emissions. I think it would be very interesting to sort of see it in the same context as national, so you sort of feel like how how, how am I part, my small stuff part of the big picture? So I think it would be, so I, there are lots of really good tools, but it would be interesting to connect them to sort of the same perspective, same kind of view. So yeah, that would be, that would be good. We could do that. Sure, <laughs> it could be. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> so we take one more. Okay, good. Okay, my name is Stefan Eriksson. Uh, I think this is a great show and, and certainly very, informative but i just like to throw out isn't it more efficient in the short scale to to really work internationally through the un for a global carbon dioxide tax for everyone to get the cap and get a, a value on? Mm. well i can stefan uh, first the first question is they are not against each other you should go both ways that is the primary thing. Secondly, we have had 30 years of international negotiations. We have se had 70 global climate meetings, and we have reached nothing more or less. So that means we can't trust on just waiting for the top-down solution for another 30 years, that then uh, we are too late. So my ad personal advice is go for the international negotiations on the one hand, but start the bottom-up negotiate uh, strategies at the same time and that will at best that will also put force and um, uh, incentives to make the global negotiations much more efficient but right now we have done force. the, mm -hmm. the but the she is a bottom up thing <laughs> isn't she she is, uh, Greta is fantastic and has a great support for what we are trying to achieve, but she is not the person that uh, pretends to have any solutions. We must focus on solutions now. We have the responsibility to do that. And I would like to say that if Sweden can present solutions, our voice in the international community and in discussions will be so much stronger. We need to do both, absolutely. I totally agree. Global climate tax is what we will need to have. Could yes? you just add something? Uh, I totally agree with Stefan that, and, and you that we need to go, do both, and we're doing this. But just to add something in the discussion about the global carbon taxes, I don't know, I don't like taxes. Many people don't like taxes. That's a communication problem. Uh, I think we should turn that communication around and talk about stop fossil fuel subsidies. Because today, the world gives fossil fuel industry $5.2 trillion in subsidies. I would like to turn around the discussion, not about taxes, but about taking away the subsidies. <coughs> it's the same thing, but it's much more efficient in communicating, I think. Yes. Stop <laughs> the excavation of fossil. <laughs> right. So are we then this time to thank you, the audience? You have been a perfect audience. Or oh, two, we would like to say something. Or you remember, you remember. I <laughs> yes, <laughs> I won't forget. There are some refreshments waiting for you before you leave, and then we can have some. Uh, well, continue the discussion, but on a more bilateral <laughs> or trilateral uh, manner. So uh, thank you so much for listening and for coming here tonight, and we look forward to meeting again. Thank you so much. <laughs>